In this video, I'm going through the solution to the June 2019 practice exam. I have three files. I have the project statement here, which you will get in a printed form when you are actually taking the exam. And it's a good idea if you're watching this video to print out the project statement and keep that in front of you. Then I have the R template and I have the RMD template. I've changed the code here to modify all of the character variables and convert them into factor variables where the reference levels are those which have the most observations. So before diving into the report, I'm just going to read through the project statement from beginning to end. And I've already done this ahead of time, so I'm not going to spend the video doing this. The items which I'm looking for are um, what has already been done. You can see here they've already removed missing data, they've removed outliers, they've re-leveled the factor variables and set up some template code. And I also want to look at the scope of the report, namely, what are they trying to do? What is the overall objective? And you can see the business problem is that you've been hired by the North Carolina Department of Transportation to help them understand the factors that contribute to severity of vehicle crashes. So the key word is to help them understand. So the goal here is inference. The goal isn't to have a really accurate model, it's to understand the underlying process. And this makes a difference in all of the model choices in the data manipulation and subsequent steps in the report. I also want to look at the point allocations. You can see the first few tasks are only worth five points each. I want to be sure to not spend a lot of time on this. And then there's a nine point question related to PCA. There's an interaction question, a question about um, selecting a distribution and link, selecting features, validating the model, interpreting the model, and then investigating ridge and lasso, a question about a decision tree, and then 20 points on the executive summary. So I want to leave plenty of time for this executive summary. And finally, I have the data dictionary here, which gives me information on all of, of the uh, data. So I can just see that it looks like there are a lot of factor variables, right? Um, in fact, except for year and month, uh, and time of day, all of these are factor variables. Which is interesting because ordinarily in regression, you have numeric variables and factors, but here it's uh, just all factor variables. Okay, so now I have the data, I can look at it, and I want to see what the first task is. I don't want to read the task from this uh, template because this is just a short, this is just like an abbreviated version. I want to be sure that I'm reading the tasks from the actual project statement because this has more information. So this says, explore the relationship of each variable to crash score. Use graphical displays and summary stats to form preliminary conclusions regarding which variables are likely to have significant predictive power. Okay, so here is some setup code that creates a histogram of the crash score. And you can see that, and I also wanna look at the summary of crash score. So I want to get the crash score column and then run a summary. So I see 
that the crash score is positive and right skewed with a mean of 6.6 .6 and a median of 5.7. And to copy this into Word, I select Copy Image and then Paste Special Device Independent Bitmap. And there it is. I can say the values range from 0 to 40. And I can look in the data dictionary to see what the interpretation is. And this says it, which measures the extent of the crash or severity. So it takes into account the number of injuries, fatalities, and the number of vehicles involved. What, is the, what are the other variables doing? Here they give us some code which uh, which which is an attempt at summarizing the data. And This is actually returning an error, so I'm going to try to fix this right now. The error is that ah, I'm missing missing part of the code here. So what I want to do is select all of the uh, categorical variables. So I want dat select if is factor and then names. So here you can see the summary statistics over all the categorical variables. Um, so here's the road feature. It looks like it's highest. So I'm just going to make some quick bullet points. Some observations from looking at the summary stats were road feature is highest for intersections. So you can see here, road character is highest for curves, curve other, and straight grade. Except this is skewed, so I should really look at the median instead of the mean. I can see the mean, the median is highest for straight grade and straight level has the highest median crash score for straight grade and straight for straight I'll just say straight roads uh, the median is not used because the distribution is skewed so road class so crash score is highest for highways as uh, most severe classes crashes are on highways 
road configuration. It looks like it's highest for uh, two-way, two-way, and two-way. So road configuration, highest for intersections and two-way roads, road surface, it's highest for grooved concrete. It's highest for concrete, for grooved concrete. Not sure what this why why it would be that way. Uh, road conditions are worst, or should I say, the most crashes occur when there are ice and slow, ice and snow and slush. Severe crashes are when road conditions are ice, snow, or slush. And the light shows that the most severe crashes are when dark, not lit, dusk, uh, or dawn. Actually, so dawn, so at dawn, dusk, and at dark. So light shows that most severe crashes are when there is poor visibility during dawn, dusk, and at night. Weather shows the highest for snow. Or in bad weather. snow or rain. And finally, we only have two variables left. Traffic control shows the highest values for stop signs, stop signal. Work area shows the most severe crashes are yes in work areas. Let's go back to this uh, project statement and see what they were asking. Use graphical displays and summary statistics to form preliminary conclusions regarding which variables are likely to have significant power. So I have done some, uh, I've read the summary statistics um, here and I've come to some conclusions. It would be good if I also uh, were to look at the uh, some graphs. And here's some bar charts. So I'll just highlight a few that I think are interesting. Um, time of day, time of day, road feature, road character. Well, this one shows the so I'll say here I also looked at bar charts uh, a few that stood out to me were uh, road feature so on the y-axis here this is showing the count or the number of crashes this isn't showing the crash score uh, road feature, 
which had most crashes at uh, none, but the second most were at intersections and driveways. Now I'll put, paste this graph in. And let's also look at road configuration. Here you can see most crashes are at two-way medians and two-way unprotected medians or two-way protected medians. Uh, very few are in uh, one-way one -way roads. Road configuration shows that most crashes are on two-way roads. Fewer are on one-way roads. This makes sense as uh, you know having oncoming traffic should make uh, driving more dangerous. Okay. Task two, reduce number of factor levels where appropriate. Several of the variables have a number of observations, have a large, have a small number of observations at some of the factor levels. Uh, so if we look back here, you can see, uh, take for example, road character. There are only 13 observations which have a category of other. And consider using knowledge of the factor levels as well as evidence from task one to combine some of them into factor levels with more observations. Okay. And they say, do not reduce the factor levels for conditions, light, and weather. Okay, so so I want to uh, just go through each of these variables and group together the, the, uh, the values which don't have uh, many records at certain factors. So this has uh, road feature has uh, only 259 on other. So I'm going to put other and ramp in the same category. And here I have some code to do this as a template. And the SOA also gave you template code to do this. However, I found it rather slow and difficult to read. And so I am using a case statement, which is more easy to read. Um, so here uh, I'm looking again at uh, road feature. So if it's either a ramp or other, I'm just going to say it's other. Otherwise, I'm going to keep it as it is. So if it's in ramp or other, uh, then I will map it to other. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to map it to what it is already. I'm not going to change it.
and this is the way to do that. And then once I've created, so once I've created this new variable, I want to check that its values are correct by looking at a count of the road feature. I can see that uh, about 1,000 observations are in the other category. Once I've checked, I'll then go ahead and save this as the uh, data object again. And I have to do this for uh, each of these variables. So just uh, go through each of these tables and then uh, look for anything that's that only has a few observations. So road character, I'm just going to say straight. Uh, well, I'm just going to put all of these curve variables uh, into other, other, and then I'll put all of these straight variables uh, in their own bucket. So it will either be straight or not straight. And this is getting rather annoying when I have to scroll up like this. So I'm going to uh, just collapse the code chunk that's above so they have more screen space. Um, also make this window wider. And I can remove the output here by clicking in this little X. Okay, so this is road character. So when road character is in straight level or straight grade or uh, straight other, I'll say straight otherwise I will say it is other and then I want to count road character Ah. And what I've done is I've actually saved over the original data. If you do this, the way to fix it is to go up to the run window and then press run all chunks above. And this will uh, restart everything to get you up to this point. Now if I run this chunk, once this loads, ah. Uh, takes a minute to create these graphs. I can then see that it's either straight or other, which is what I want. Let's get rid of this output again and look. Uh, so we've done road feature, road character, road class is next. So I'm going to save this as the original data again. And then road class is either state highway or other or highway. Oh, this is this is actually okay as is. I don't need to change this because there are enough observations in, in the lowest bucket. Uh, road configuration only has 56 observations in unknown. So I'm going to group these together. I'm just going to use a binary. Okay, so I'm going to say if it's in, configuration is in one way or unknown, then it will be other.
else it's going to be two way. And then I will do a count road configuration. Oops. Okay. And I can see there are about 20,000 in, in the two way. And if I look here, I can add these three values together 12,000 plus 7,000 plus 2,000 is about 20,000. So this makes sense. And I then save this back as the original data. And um, you can now see this is a fairly mechanical task. Um, Next is road surface. I'm just going to say uh, other and grooved concrete are in the same bin. Otherwise, I'm going to use the original road surface. And again, I can check. 441 is about 370 plus 70. It's exactly 370 plus 70. And I'm just going to continue doing this uh, for all of the for all of the other values. And one variable which is tricky is the time of day. If you look at the time of day, you can see that it's numeric from one to six. In the data dictionary, You can see that it's the time of day and four hour blocks, or one is an integer from one to six. So 1 a.m. is midnight to 4 a.m. Two would be 4 a.m. Uh, to 8 a.m. Six would be 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. and so forth. So basically this is one is the early morning. One to two is the morning. And then three to four is the day, and then five to six is the night. So that I will just create a new uh, variable that captures this. So time of day is equal to case when time of day is in one to two then it will be morning when it's in three to four it will be day and then when it's in five or six it will be night Look at a quick count. Let's see, oh, there are some NA values. Why would there be NA values? 
It's one, two, three, four, five, six. So one, two, ah, I see. I, so there should be three, four, then five and six. Now there are no NA values. So I'll go ahead and save this back as the original data. Ah, and I've made the same mistake again, so I need to get rid of this count, go up to run, and then say run all chunks above so that I get the right version of the data. Task three. Use observations from principal component analysis to generate a new feature. Your assistant has provided code to run a PCA on three variables. Run the code on these three variables. Interpret the output, including the loadings on significant principal components. Generate one new feature based on your observations, which may also involve dropping some current variables. Your assistant has provided some notes using PCA on factor variables in the RMD file. The following chunks perform PCA and selected variables. The results may provide some insights with respect to combining variables to create new features. These chunks look at the three other weather variables. So what is PCA? What is PCA? It's, it's dimensionality reduction. If you have a bunch of variables like this, x1, x2, x3, x4, and you want to simplify them, you run principal component analysis and it returns you a list of principal components, which are columns that capture the same information as the original X, but do so with fewer dimensions. So in this case, we have variables that are correlated, related to the weather and light and the road conditions. And we want to create a single principal component that captures all of that information, that captures the road conditions. To do this, uh, they first have to convert these factor levels into binary zero, one variables because uh, principal component analysis requires numeric values. That's what this code does. So here when I look at the data, I see um, there are indicator variables for each of the factor levels. So we want to reduce all of these dimensions. So this is, uh, you know, one, two, three, four. It's like 10 different dimensions or 20 different dimensions. We want to reduce this 20 dimensional matrix down to a single principal component. And here they run PR comp and they look at a summary which gives the uh, percent of variance explained for each of the principal components. So the first principal component explains 22% of the variance, the second explains about 12%, the third explains uh, 10%. So forth. So you can see the cumulative percent uh, of variance explained continues to increase. So, for if you just use the first four principal components, you would be able to explain 56% of the variation in these columns. The following code chunk shows you how to construct a new feature using insights gained from the loadings. Okay. You, the particular choice of binarized variables and weights are artificial for this illustration and not based on an actual PCA. So they say center and scale the variables, create a new data frame, and then create and then create a new column called snow not rain, which is equal to some number 
times road conditions ice snow plus some other number times weather snow plus or minus uh, some other number times uh, weather rain. So, so in other words, they've just set up this code and they want you to change the numbers to be uh, appropriate in this context. So if you look at, uh, so the way PCA works is it's a transformation. It takes the original variables and it adds together um, the weights of some weights times each of the original variables to get a new variable. The principal component is a linear combination of the original variables. The weights, also called the, the loadings or the rotations, are mathematically derived from the algorithm. So what you have to do is take these rotations here and use them to construct a new feature which will be useful to interpret. So here, uh, you can let's just ch choose one of the variables. I'll just use the first principal component and look at the weights of each of the variables. So I'm, go I'm going to say dat2 and what should this variable be called? Well, this is going to take into account um, just the variables which have the most impact. So because PCA scales the variables before uh, before calculating the weights, the absolute value of these loadings is indicative of how much impact or how much weight that variable has in creating the principal component. So I'm just going to take like the top three. Uh, I'll take conditions dry, I'll take conditions wet, and I'll take weather clear. So again, that was road conditions dry, road conditions wet, and weather clear. Right, so I'll just I'll just call this column good weather is equal to minus five one times I need this data, then I want the column road conditions dry plus the weight that's on road conditions wet. Road conditions wet is 0 0.49, 0 0.47. Let's just, let's just round to 0 0.5. I need to get this data. And then finally, weather clear. Weather clear is weighted with negative 0.46. OK. And I'm getting some type of error here because I don't have a multiplication sign.
something's not right here. This is a null value. Uh, so I'm not using the right column name. I want to use this one. Road conditions dry. Road conditions wet. Weather clear. Okay. Now let's look at the first few rows. Okay, let's also look at a summary. It goes from negative 0.7 up to 3. Okay? And then, then what do I have to do? Generate a new feature. And I'll need to add this to the data, right? Because I'll need to use this later on. So I'll say dat good weather is equal to dat two good weather. Okay, now is the most important part. Now I have to explain everything that I've done. Uh, so I wanna go to the Word document and just start, uh, I first have to explain uh, all of these factor levels because I've already, I'll come back to this. So, principal component analysis is a dimensionality reduction method which uh, removes, which collapses the uh, I dimensional data down into simpler principal components. Each principal component, called a PC, is a linear combination of the original variables where the weights used are the loadings. I first converted all of the factors into numeric 0, 1 indicators. Then I applied scaling so that they are all between 0. Uh, then I applied scaling. I just realized scaling isn't actually necessary in this case because they're already just indicator variables. They're already between 0 and 1. Um, so then I converted them. Okay. These variables these variables road conditions light and uh, weather I just realized um I don't use the light, I don't use any information from light in my feature. See how the size of these, of all the light values is all less than 0.2 in absolute value. This is okay. If I wanted to, um, if I wanted to create a, a feature which incorporated the light information, maybe I would base that off of the second principal component because here you can see it's giving more weight to light to daylight and more weight to uh, lit, but then it's also giving less weight to road conditions dry and less weight to uh, weather. And to, so that would be the common trend, right? Because these are so correlated, and each principal component is independent of one another. That if it's giving more weight to if one principal component is giving more weight to one variable, 
then the other variable, the other principal components um, have to be giving less weight to that variable automatically. Okay, then I used the formation on the weights to construct a new feature which captures info regarding poor weather conditions. This was minus 0 0.51 dry 0 0.5 road conditions wet minus 0 0.46 road road conditions uh, weather clear Let's just double check. Minus 0 0.51, conditions dry, conditions wet, 0 0.49, 0 0.5, and 46 times weather clear. Okay, that looks good. I then added this data, this feature, to the data. Task 4. Select one pair of features that should be included as an interaction variable in a generalized linear model. Do this by first proposing two variables that are likely to interact and then using the supplied box plot function to confirm the existence of an interaction. Continue until a promising interaction has been identified. Do not use the features that were part of the PCA exploration in task 3 when looking for interactions. Include your selected interaction when constructing a GLM in the following tasks. First of all, what is an interaction? An interaction is when the effect that a variable has on the target depends on other variables that are in the model. If the response is the variable y, and there is a predictor x, which is numeric, and a predictor color, which is a factor, then if there's no interaction, the effect of x onto y is the same for blue as for red. If there's an interaction between x and color, then the slope for x will be different for blues rather than for reds. In other words, the impact that x has on y for blues is different than the impact that x has on y for reds. Let's look at the variables that we have in our model. Let's consider the real life implications for a few interactions. First, consider work area and road class. Everyone knows what it's like to drive through a work area. You'll see orange signs and a reduced speed limit. This could have a different impact on your risk of being in a crash if you're on a highway or on a non-highway, if you're in a suburban area, for instance. Or consider time of day and road configuration. At night, you may be at a elevated risk of being in an accident on a highway versus being on a highway during the day, for instance. Or road character and road class. If the road is curved and it's a highway, the curves will generally be more gradual. You will not have abrupt turns. If you're on a main road, for instance, and you have a turn, this could lead to uh, more accidents. 
or traffic control and road feature. If there's a traffic control, such as a stop sign or a stoplight, this could help to improve the safety of intersections rather than having a four-way stop or perhaps a rotary. You could test out any of these two combinations. In this example, I will test out the first two. What I'm looking for in these graphs is to see if there is a significant difference across the x variable. Here you see two graphs. On the left, you see all accidents which are not in work areas. And on the right, accidents which occurred in work areas. Each of these bars shows the distribution of crash scores for state highways, US highways, and uh, other. So as you can see, for non-work areas, the crash scores are about the same. They have a median of about seven. On the right, you see work area. So the, this is all crashes that occur in a construction zone. Now you can see for state highways and other, the crash score has a median of about seven. But for US highways, the crash score has a median of about eight. You can also see that uh, there are no crash scores that are above 20 for highways, but there are for non-highways. This suggests that there's an interaction between these two variables. Now let's look at time of day and road configuration. Across each of these graphs, you see morning, day, and night. In each graph, you see if the road is uh, two-way or other. That is, it's one-way or um, some other type of road. Now, very quickly, you can see that the median crash score is about the same across all of these graphs. You can also see that two-way roads uh, tend to have a um, higher crash score than, than non-two-way uh, roads. So this means that there is not a clear interaction. So to summarize, I'll go ahead and type this into the document. Start with the most simple explanation possible. An interaction is when the impact that a variable has on the target is different depending on other variables which are in the model. In this case, we considered two interactions. Work area and road class and time of day and road configuration. In a construction zone, the risk of an accident may be different for highways versus main roads. Let's copy the graph. Copy image and then press Alt H V S D Enter. 
On the graph below, we see the distribution, crash scores for work areas. On the left, uh, for non-work areas and work areas, right? Uh, the um, highways appear to be riskier in work areas than in non-work areas. And this indicates that there is an interaction. Uh, time of day and row configuration. So our thought was that highways could be riskier during the night hours rather than during the day. Again, copy the image and then press Alt H V S D enter. The graphs below show accidents during the day, morning, and night. All of the uh, six plots show about the same distribution. The median crash score is flat at about uh, a little bit less than 10, about seven, which means that no interaction is present. Task five, select a distribution and link function. Evaluate two potential combinations of distribution and link functions by applying a geolog to the training data set. Typing family into the console will provide help. Included are the combinations that can be used with the GLM function. Explain prior to fitting the models why your two choices are reasonable for this problem. Fit both models using the features developed in task one to four and select the best combination, justifying your choice. Okay, so before, um, before even starting the, the question, I'm going to write down what I know A GLM is a model that relates the mean of the response distribution to the linear predictor through a link function. Now, what does this mean? It means that you specify that Y, the response, as a specific distribution, and the mean of that distribution depends on the data. So if we look uh, at the chapter on GLMs, you can see that there are basically two components. There's a random component, which is that Y conditioned on the data X is some exponential distribution. And that there's a link between the covariates x and the mean. So you can say that the mean of this exponential distribution is a function of the data, and it's, it's actually connected to the data through a link function. So you can say that mu is the expected value of the response given x. So once you adjust for the data, 
once you take into account the individual uh, crashes characteristics, was it at night, was it at day, was it raining, was it snowing, so you take into account all that information, the mean of that crash score is going to be equal to mu. So for each person, for each crash, there'll be uh, a different value of mu, right? Crashes that occurred at night will have a different average, or rather a different mean than crashes that occur during the day. But all of them will have the same exponential family distribution. They might all be from an exponential distribution. They might all be from a Gaussian distribution. But we allow the parameter mu to vary depending on the data. So they're saying evaluate two potential combinations for distribution and link function. Um, so the, the crash score, remember, is right skewed and strictly positive. So it only makes sense to use a distribution that is right skewed and positive. You don't want to use a distribution that allows for negative values or one that is um, symmetric, like a normal distribution, because you can see that this isn't symmetric and it's strictly positive. So that would probably result in a bad model. So you don't even have to try it. Um, the crash score distribution is right skewed and strictly positive. This means that a response distribution such as the Gaussian inverse Gaussian or gamma would be good choices. We can look in R by using the uh, question mark GLM query to get the documentation. So we can see uh, that it takes a formula and then there's some family. So this can be, you know, binomial, Gaussian, gamma, inverse, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a link function here. And this can be of several values. This can be logit, probit, cotchit, c log log, identity log, square root, inverse square, inverse. So I know that logit and probit and cotchit and c log log are all for classification, so I don't need to consider those. So these are the possible values identity log, square root inverse squared. Uh, so they just say choose two. Um, so the Gaussian distribution is symmetric, right? And this distribution of crash scores is not symmetric. And so um, I'm not going to consider the Gaussian. So I'm just going to consider the inverse Gaussian or the gamma. And um, let's look again. So let's look at the link functions. The link functions can be uh, what we said. It could be if it's identity, it means that the mean function is just equal to the linear predictor. And the range is any positive or negative number. But the range of the gamma or the inverse Gaussian is always positive. Mean, the mu is always positive. And so it doesn't make sense to use the identity link. We want to use a link function that has a positive mean. So this would be the log 
or the inverse squared, or maybe the square root. Uh, the mean, the mean of a gamma and inverse Gaussian distribution is always positive. And so we want, so I want to use a link function which results in the mean being, uh, being positive. Uh, this suggests the log square root or inverse squared are best. Um, now also note that we also want to um, and be able to interpret the model. Right, because we want to be able to interpret the model easily, um, we should use the log. Uh, this results in the model uh, being multiplicative and the uh, coefficients and the and the coefficients being interpreted as a percentage change in the crash score. If you're not familiar with all of this terminology, reading the chapter on GLMs will help. So this means that my two combinations choices were, uh, I'll say gamma with say log inverse Gaussian with log link. And gamma response family with log link. Okay, now let's fit these two models. Do you notice anything? I've just done about five minutes of talking before even running any code. This is classic um, when it comes to these types of GLMs questions. Um, they want you to be able to explain what you're doing as much as they want you to be able to actually edit the code. Okay, so this is running it. Uh, so I have to first run the code to create a training and a test set. And I'll say that before fitting the model, I created a training test set. Okay, and then I fit, so this is just GLM OLS. So this is their uh, baseline model you can see that a lot of these variables are insignificant. Okay, um, so I'm just going to remove this uh, OLS from the name so that I can just copy and paste the code more easily. And let's just look at the AIC value. AIC is here. Ah, let's go back to the problem statement because I think I'm going too fast. Okay, select a distribution and link function. Evaluate two potential combinations. Explain prior to fitting why your two choices are reasonable. Fit both models using the features developed in tasks one to four and select the best combination justifying your choice. Okay, so I just so uh, first I fit an OLS model, which res with all variables, which resulted in an AIC of that.
Now let's now let's try the gamma link equals log. You see again that a lot of the variables are not significant. Uh, the AIC is lower. Gamma log link at AIC this. Now, what is AIC? Let's pretend that I did not remember. I would go to the console, type in question, and type in the question mark AIC, and then I would get the documentation, and I could see that it is minus two times the log likelihood plus k times n per r, and number of parameters. When k is equal to two, it's equal to AIC. So it's minus two times L plus k plus two times P. So AIC equals minus two L plus k plus two times P. So for L, the log likelihood uh, and P, the number of parameters, the AIC is this. Right? And so if the AI, if the log likelihood is high, then this will get smaller. Or if you add a lot of parameters, and so p gets really large, this will get higher. And a good model has a really high likelihood, but doesn't need to use very many variables. So when AIC is low, it means that the model is better. When AIC is high, it means the model is worse. So this is um, so this is uh, so the gamma model is better because the AIC is lower. This means that. Um, a lower AIC value is better as um, the model is a better fit. The gamma has lower AIC than the OLS. Now let's look at the inverse Gaussian. Ah, and um, I just realized, I just realized that I did not add the interaction term to the formula. This formula here is saying, use crash score with all variables, right? And what variables are included? Let's look at the names of the training data. And you can see here um, that my good weather feature is included, but I, I need to add the interaction. So I want to say plus work area times, uh, what was the other variable that we said we wanted to use? Work area and road class. Uh, now I have to refresh the, uh, I have to refresh the AIC values that I pasted into the report. And 
And this is actually giving me an error. It's saying prediction is from a rank deficient fit. Why is that? Let's look at the summary. And we can see, oh, good weather has a coefficient that is missing. What this means is that some of the variables are linear combinations of each other. And this makes sense because good weather was a linear combination of uh, weather and time of day and light, right? So I want to uh, remove weather and light and time of day. Um, so what I'm going to do, the way that I'll do this is before creating the training data, I'm going to say dat is equal to dat and then select minus light minus weather minus time of day. It'll just drop the columns before creating the training and testing split. Okay, now, now the columns are linearly independent, and so there are, uh, the, the error went away. Now I can look at the AIC. Oh, and they are also looking at the RMSC, so I, I will look at the I will look at both. So, the RMSC and MAE are higher for the OLS model. AIC is 99, RMSC is 4.2. For the gamma, the AIC is lower, which is better. The RMSC is, RMSC is also lower, which is actually worse. So, so, so the first the first model though doesn't make sense because it's uh, it's it's using the Gaussian distribution, which allows for negative predicted values. So for L the log likelihood, um, right? P the number of parameters. We know that a lower AIC is better. The first the OLS model had better lower RMSC. Ah, no, actually, let me rephrase that. RMSC is 4.2847 versus 4.2846. Lower RMSC is better. So the first model had worse, higher RMSC as well. Finally, let's look at the inverse Gaussian. And when I try to run this, it gives an error. It says, cannot correct step size. This means that the algorithm can't converge. The inverse Gaussian model did not converge. The final model 
that I chose was the gamma with blog link. And let's look at the summary. We see, again, a lot of the variables are not significant. We also see that year and month are included. Uh, these are included as numeric values. So if you include year, um, we can we can just see that year goes from 2014 to 2019. So if you include it as a numeric value, it's just uh, it would be capturing a linear trend. Month with an uppercase M is from 1 to 12. And it's approximately has about the same number of observations throughout. So if there was a seasonal trend by month, um, if during the winter months um, there would be a higher crash score than you know during the summer months, then you could include month as a numeric value. Um, you could also include month as a factor value because there might be non-linearities. Right when you get to December, for instance, when month is equal to 12, there might suddenly be a lot of snow and that would result in a lot more crashes than just one month before when month was equal to 11. And so in that case, including it as a factor um, would also make sense, but there would be a lot of um, there would be a lot of noise because a lot of the months would not make a significant difference um, in the model. So in this case, I'm just going to uh, remove remove month entirely. I'll, I'll keep year in because it might capture some trend over time. Uh, so I have to go back and remove this from the uh, other models. Again, we see the same uh, change in the RMSC and AIC. Okay, task six, select features. Evaluate two potential combination, uh, select features using AIC or BIC. Briefly describe them and outline the difference between the two criteria. Uh, so, this is where I would look at, at, at my formulas in the R documentation. And I would just say, okay, this is uh, our log. So, so, I would explain what AIC is. And then I would also explain what BIC is. Uh, so, BIC uses uh, K equal to log N. So, BIC takes into account the sample size N. BIC is minus two times L plus K times P, where K is equal to log of N. Where am I getting this? I'm getting this from right here. So this is minus two times L plus K times number of parameters, where K is equal to log N, or 
BIC. So this takes into account the sample size. So that BIC is higher, worse for uh, larger data sets. All right, well, let me rephrase that. So BIC is penalized more for larger data sets. So, so if you have a really large data set, then BIC expects that you will have, um, let me rephrase that. The penalty for having a lot of parameters in a model is different depending on the size of the data set. For AIC, the penalty is the same regardless of the size of the data set. So the penalty on the likelihood is greater for larger data sets. And for smaller data sets, because um, here, if uh, if your n is really large, then log n will also be large. And you multiply that times p, the number of parameters in the model, that will result in a much higher number, which will give you a worse BIC. If you have a small data set, then log n will be small, and so um, the penalty for having a lot of parameters will not be as I. All right, so what is log n? Because if you compare these two, you can see that these are uh, equal if log n is equal to 2, right? But what is our log n? It's the log of the n row of our training data, which is about 9, 9.7. In our data, log of n is about 10, which means that um, BIC is, uh, is favoring simpler models than AIC, right? Because, so, so in other words, if I used AIC, I would get a, uh, a a complex model would get a good score. If I used BIC, that same model would get a worse score. And in this case, we want to interpret we want to create an interpretable model, and so uh, we want fewer variables, which BIC will uh, favor over AIC. So, so this is the code to set the step AIC process. So the first step is to set this GOM, to set this um, intercept only model, which is just, which just means that it predicts the average crash score. Um, but the distribution needs to be the type that we use. So in this case, it's gamma link equals log. And then this is the step AIC procedure that takes in this intercept only model and then using a forward direction, which means that it will, it will start with no variables in the model and it will iteratively add variables if they improve the score. And it's going to use BIC because uh, K is going to be the log of the n row of the training data, which is log n in our formula. And uh, upper here, it's set up to use the uh, the ordinary least squares GLM, but we wanted this to use um, our GLM here. 
So let's uh, rerun this. I'm going to tell the R to not eval this, not evaluate this chunk here because this ran into an error. Um, and so now we have the GOM with the gamma log link. That will be the uh, upper model. And now it's fitting different models, and at each step it's evaluating the, uh, the BIC, and it's removing variables which don't improve the score. Actually, let me rephrase that. Because we're using the forward direction, it's starting with no variables, and then iteratively adding variables, which improve the score. So here's the final formula. It only uses crash score and road feature. Ah, That's not very interesting. It's only using two variables. What if we change this from k is equal to uh, from k is equal to log of n row train, which we said was about 10, to about 2? So we'll make we'll make the penalty less for having a complex model. What will happen? I would think that this would result in uh, more variables being used. So if the penalty term is lower, then um, more variables will um, show up as being significant. And that's the case. Uh, so here we have crash score, road class, feature, traffic control, surface, character, and year. So I will refit a GOM uh, that uses these. And the way that I'm doing this is I'm just changing the formula. So I copied the formula from the step AIC procedure. And then I'm going to uh, replace this first argument, which is the formula. Now, if I look at the sum, well, let's first look at the AIC. Uh, 93253. 93253 versus 93272. So I can see that this is better. Let's also look at the summary. still see that a lot of these variables are insignificant, uh, but there are more variables that are significant, uh, which you can see from looking at these uh, dots. So one dot is somewhat significant, two dots is more significant, three dots is highly significant. So let's just um, let's let's try to document some of this. Um, so here um, I tried. I thought that BIC would be better because it would uh, create a simpler model. However, this only resulted in two variables being included, which is is too simple. So I changed back to using AIC, which resulted in uh, ro in road class 
road feature traffic control road surface and road character. The summary was or let me let me say let me say the the AIC and RMSC were both better. I'm going to copy this into the document. First I'm going to make this window narrower. So that the text doesn't uh, doesn't get too large in the Word document. And then I can see that it's actually copied much more information than I need. So I'm going to undo that and try again. Now I'll make the font smaller by using control left right left bracket to decrease the font size. Okay. So many of the variables show up as not uh, significant. And they say some of the features may lack predictive power and may lead to overfitting. Determine which should be retained. Use step AIC. Make this determination. There are two decisions to make. Make each decision based on the business problem. They say there are two decisions to make. Direction or... Um, using AIC or BIC. So we've already elaborated on using AIC or BIC. Um, we, so we started using the forward direction. I used the forward, so let me just explain what forward direction is. The forward direction starts with no variables in the model and then only adds those which improve the score. The backward direction starts with no variables and uh, removes all that are not significant. Because um, you know I want a simpler model, uh, I want to start with few variables and only include a variable if it is significant. So they're basically asking you to justify your choice of parameter. And uh, that's, that's what I did. I could also just rerun the code and then look at the resulting model But this isn't required. This is just for ex so. If I change um, change this code to direction equals backward, uh, and I have to be careful here because um, I've already created this GLM object here. So I have to go back. I have to go back and recreate the uh, the GLM that has all the variables. Then, then I can run the ba the um, the backward stepwise selection model. And if I do this, um, I'm getting an error. It's resulting in an intercept-only model. So I don't need to spend time 
figuring this out. I, I can justify my choice here just by saying that I want to start with no variables and then only add those that are predictive. Okay, uh, task seven, validate the model. Run uh, against the test set and compare it to the OLS model. Also provide and interpret the diagnostic plots. Okay, I've already done this earlier on, which is okay because I can just uh, move this down. Ah, no, actually, let me rephrase this. Run the model from task six. So this model from task six, which is the one with the fewer variables. Uh, so they want to see this model. They want to see these results. Um, which is better. So the, R, the so the AIC and RMSC were both um, than the OLS model and the prior gamma models. Now let's look at the diagnostic plots. Diagnostic plots show the residuals. The assumptions are that uh, the residuals are that the residuals are scattered at around zero, and there's no pattern. That uh, the theoretical quantiles are approximately normal. Uh, this, so this is actually showing the deviance residuals, and it's if the um, if the theoretical if the points are all along a straight line, it means that the deviance residuals are normally distributed, which means that the assumption that you made about the distribution and link function is appropriate. If it, this was not along a straight line, if this had some weird pattern, um, then it would mean that the model isn't a good fit. So here we can see that the points are approximately normal for uh, the middle values. There's some deviation along the tails. These uh, residuals are approximately uh, random. There's not really a clear pattern, as well as the uh, deviance residuals here. Now, uh, it's easy to get confused between deviance residual and raw residual. If you look here at the graphs, if it's just called a residual, it means it's the raw residual. If it's called this, the deviance residual, it will explicitly say deviance residual. So these are the raw residuals, and these two graphs are deviance residuals. Okay, so I want to just copy these into the uh, document. And I have to use the... Uh, special copy function, special paste function. Um, the raw residuals are centered at zero, which means that right here, if you look on the y-axis, this red line is right at zero, and uh, randomly scattered. and random. This is good. Now let's look at the QQ plot. Q 
qqplot shows the theoretical quantiles uh, of the deviance residuals against the actual quantiles. These uh, are approximately normal for most values. There is some deviation along the tails, but this is uh, approximately true. Good fit. Okay. And let's also look at this plot of the deviance residuals against the predicted values. Okay. Task eight, interpret the model. Run the selected model on the full data set and provide the output. So, I just changed the training to use the full data. And here's the output. And so I reran the model on the full data set. What this does, this, um, this helps to make the uh, coefficients more consistent as they have smaller error due to the larger training size. Interpretation is that the crash score and so they, they're specifically saying interpret the results in a manner it will provide useful information to the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Right. The crash score, the target variable is the crash score, uh, which is higher for accidents which are more severe and have more vehicles involved. The crash score is, um, now you just have to remember that if you have a log link function, then the coefficients are interpreted as a percentage change in the response. Um, so if you take, um, If you take the exponent of the, of the coefficients, well, let, let me just say, if so, because the coefficients are all, um, yeah, because the coefficients are uh, basically are small, that uh, you can just interpret the results 
by um, looking at the uh, you can interpret the results as being a percentage change in the response. So what you want to do is to say So because we use the log link function, the appropriate way to interpret the coefficients is to take the exponent and subtract 1. So the way to do this is to say exponent coefficients of GOM minus 1. And this will give me um, a number, a, a list of numbers. And I'm going to round round to uh, just one decimal place. Right, and um, this, this now gives me the approximate percentage change. The approximate percentage change in the crash score for uh, these different factors. So if the road class is a highway, then the crash score is 4% higher than non-highways. If the road feature if is driveway, then the crash score is 3% higher than non-driveways. Right? Because each of these features is a Boolean value, it's 0 or 1. It's always either, if it is this feature, it's this percent different than not being that feature. Um, yeah, so how, how would I interpret this? Uh, well, if I, if, I do, if I do a little bit of uh, setup, I can make this a lot easier. So I can say uh, I'm just going to use Excel to do this. Sometimes this will save you time. I take that back. It doesn't. So what I could do is, I would do GOM. I would do tidy. I need to load the broom library, and then the only columns that I need are term. And then I would mutate and say, I'll say percent change is equal to exponent estimate minus 1. And then I would round this to two decimal places. You could do this a number of ways. You could also do this. Um, 
could also do this in Excel. You could just hard code the values yourself directly into a Microsoft Word table. Um, I'm just doing this in R to show you how to use the broom library. And I'm using this, I have to use this dplyr select because I've already loaded the math library when I was using step AIC. And math also has a function called select. And so I have to tell R to specifically use dplyr. Um, so here's the percent change. If I want to uh, remove estimate column, I can just do this. Again, I have to use dplyr select. Okay. You can see this is a really complex model. There are a lot of variables. Um, which is perhaps not I so so I want to make the model simpler, right? Um, it's it's so it, how do I make the model simpler? Um, well, I could use, um, I could use, there, there are a number of different ways that I could, um, One way is just to change the value of k. If I change the value of k, it will um, it will um, change the penalty term. So if I make k larger, it will make the model simpler. So the, when I used um, BIC, it was the same as using k is equal to log n, which is about 10. But I, I don't want to go that far because that resulted in uh, only two variables being included. So instead, I'll just set k to some middle number between 2 and 10. So I'll just try setting k is equal to 4. These plots will be about the same, right? The, these still look fine. Um, now if I look here, this results, ah, this is the backward direction. So I'm going to go to forward direction. Say k is equal to 4. And I have to go back and rerun uh, this GOM here. And when I do this, you'll see that I have a simpler model. Now I just have road class, feature, and traffic control. Okay, uh, so now if I go back to, ah, this is actually the same. I had road class, feature, and traffic control here already. Um, so I, I just, I should just, so I have to remove one of these variables. I'm just going to set it back to log and route train, which is using BIC again. If I do this, it results in uh, road class and feature. So traffic control gets removed and road service and character. It's just using road class and road feature. But you have to consider the number of factors that are in each of these 
not so there is this is only two um, you know variables but when you actually when you actually run the GOM it's it breaks this up into indicator columns for each of the factor levels so if I do this it still results in seven variables so Uh, that's what I'm going to do here. And if this was a real exam and I had to choose between a model with 20 variables and a model with six variables, um, I would I would I would err on the side of simplicity because everything I do has to be interpreted. So. So all of these variables are um, significant, which is good. Um, what if I tr what if I just try adding back traffic control? Because if I if I have more so if I add traffic control, uh, stop sign and signal show up as being significant, but yield and other don't. Um, that's okay because these these two levels are significant, even if these are not. So, so uh, even though I'm not I'm not strictly relying on the stepwise selection method, I went back and I added traffic control. It improves the model because it helps to make it more interpretable and it is significant for stop signs. Okay, now I want to uh, copy these into Excel and there's one other row here for traffic control other so this is the um, this is the percent change in crash score uh, or let me rephrase that it's the difference it's the percent difference in crash score for these uh, for these values. So first of all, I want you to remove formats, and then I don't need the intercept. Oh, I'll keep the intercept. And it's not required that I format this perfectly, uh, but it is just making it easier to read. Because this is a solution video, it's better if it's easier to read. So um, here's the interpretation. Um, I, so I can interpret the coefficients uh, as being the difference, the percent difference in crash score for these for roads that have these characteristics uh, for highways 
U.S. highways, the crash score is 4% higher than for non-highways. For intersections, crash score is 5% higher than for non-intersections. I'll just convert this into some bullet points. For uh, other, what is road class other? This is when I have to go back to the um, to the data manipulations that I did to road class. Oh, so it's either highway or non-highway. For non-highways. And non-state highways. Uh, the score is 8% lower. And then for US highways, it's 4% higher. For intersections, it's 5% higher. For driveways, 5 or 3% higher. Ramps are 10% lower. Other, I'll say non driveways. And ramps are 3% lower. Uh, traffic controls are 6% higher. Stop signs are 8% higher. Yield. Signs and uh, other and non. I'll just say say non-stop signs. Four percent higher, and you can see here that these coefficients are going to depend on how you've binned the variables together. For instance, if I had put yield and other together into their own other category, then um, there would just be stop sign or non-stop sign. Or if you if you had intersection and non-intersection, then this would change the coefficients slightly. It might be better if you had fewer um, coefficients of the model, right? Because simpler models are generally better. If the if the error if the R if the AIC and the RMSC are the same, it's better to have um, a simpler model. If you don't match this solution exactly, um, that's 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 probably okay. Um, there are different ways of, uh, of of simplifying the factors. Okay. Um, task nine: Investigate ridge and lasso. So now we're looking at the uh, task eight. Task eight was to interpret the model. And I've actually um, 
move that into task seven. Task seven was validate the model. Ah. So here's task seven. And then task eight. And task nine is investigate the lasso and ridge. Code is provided to run ridge and lasso regressions. Use the features developed in task one to four. No other changes in parameters need to be done. Compare the arm received the test set to that of your model. Note that GeoAutomNet is restricted in model forms. The code provide predicts the target variable using a Gaussian distribution in the identity link. There's no need to try other combinations. Okay, so here you can see the code is set up uh, to use all the variables. I want to include my interaction work area and I forget the, uh, the other interaction that I had. It was work area and road class. Road class. And um, before uh, even looking at this result, uh, we should explain what a ridge uh, and lasso regression is what they what they are um, so ridge and lasso are types of penalized regression using a parameter using parameters uh, alpha and lambda, uh, we can pose a penalty on the model score for the uh, size of the coefficients. You know, this helps to remove unnecessary variables and to make the coefficients smaller. When alpha is equal to one, we have a lasso, which means that the penalty is the uh, L1 norm, or the sum of the absolute values of the coefficients. The value, the parameter lambda controls the, um, the amount that this uh, impacts the model. As lambda increases, the model is made simpler as variables are dropped. So that's what this graph is showing here. On the x-axis, you see the values of lambda, and on the y-axis, you see the error. And cross-validation selects the value which is lowest. Cross-validation was used to uh, choose the best lambda. Okay.
So once I run this, uh, which is cv.glmnet, it will give me the value um, lambda min, which is based on the cross validation. So I just need to make sure that I update this formula here to include the interaction term. Ah, actually, let me rephrase that. I don't need to. Do, I don't need to do this because this is using the same matrix X. Um, I but yes, I do need to change the formula down here though. And this uh, shows which variables are included. If the variable has a dot next to it, it means that that variable wasn't used. So you can see a lot of these are, are zero. A lot of the coefficients are zero, indicating that the variable wasn't used in the model. And I can look at the RMSE, it's 4.287. And 4.287 versus uh, our other RMSC, which is 4.286. Here's the RMSC GOM, say the gamma, gamma GOM was 4.286. The RMSE of the lasso is high is lower, which is better. The RMSE is better than that of the gamma with forward stepwise selection. You can look at the actual variables that are in the model here. Because our goal isn't strictly to get the lowest error. Uh, we also want to see um, the, how many variables. So there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Uh, 13. So there are 13 variables in the lasso model. In the GLM, there were fewer. 3, 6, 9, there were only 10. So the lasso, I'll just say, well, the Well, the lasso results in better RMSE. There are 13 variables instead of uh, 10 in the GOM. The State Highway Department, the Department of Transportation, is looking for a model that is easy to interpret. And so the, the GLM is better here. If we had used, so um, what they basically want you to do is they want you to be able to compare using a lasso versus using a stepwise selection model with forward or backward direction. So what's happening is that um, we're moving along the bias variance trade-off. The bias variance trade-off means that if we want to have a simpler model, we are going to lose some performance, some flexibility. So 
if we had just an ordinary GLM, we would have um, we would we would have the uh, the the performance of the the ordinary least squares model. If we used variable selection, such as step AIC or the lasso, we would remove some variables and the model would be more interpretable. If instead we used um, an elastic net, which is just a, a, a lasso or a ridge model, then we could get um, more performance, better performance, more flexibility, but we would have lower interpretability, right? If we had more, uh, more coefficients in the model, the model will have a lower error. It will be more accurate. But because there are more variables, it will be more difficult to interpret. The bias variance trade-off says that the MSC is equal to the variance of the model plus the bias squared. When we have a lot of parameters of the model, the variance is high. And when we have uh, too few variables, the bias is really high. So by, uh, by using some type of um, metric like log likelihood or RMSC, we're trying to find a point where uh, the error is lowest. But we don't want either of these to be too large. We don't want the variance to be too high, and we don't want the bias to be too high. Variance trade-off says that as the models Um, as the model's flexibility increases, or as more parameters, more variables are added, uh, the performance will decrease. Um, the, the lasso, in this case, has um, more parameters. Uh, and is more flexible, but is also harder to interpret. The GOM has fewer parameters and is easier to interpret. Uh, and, and this is dependent on the choices of um, using AIC or using BIC using the forward direction or the backward direction. If uh, I had used the uh, you know backward backward selection, there would have been more variables. If I had used ridge instead of the lasso, uh, all variables would be included, but um, and the error would be lower, right? If you include all the variables, um, ridge regression would probably result in the lowest error, but it would also result in the most complexity. Uh, task 10, consider a decision tree. An alternative to the GLM is a regression decision tree. Do not create such a tree. Comment on the pros and cons of using a regression tree for the problem versus the GLM construction in task 6. Um, so they're basically just asking for you to summarize what a decision tree is and how it may be better or worse in this context. So decision tree is a way of breaking uh, the decision tree separates out uh, separates out crashes with a high score from those 
with a low score based on a series of yes, no questions. Uh, so a few advantages to using a tree would be uh, it automatically detects interactions and uh, interactions and uh, handles missing values which uh, you know our assistant has already done. It is uh, it's still easy to interpret. And it detects nonlinearities, which which doesn't apply here because all variables are categorical. Disadvantages are uh, since each prediction is the average of training samples, the, um, the predicted crash score would be uh, you know, stepwise. And by this I mean um, because in a tree each each um, each prediction is just the average of all the other values that are in the terminal nodes, you get um, predictions which are just somewhat uh, discrete. It's not it's not a you don't get smooth predictions. So when you divide the um, when you divide the space up into it with a decision tree, it basically asks a series of yes or no questions based on the inputs. And then the predicted values are just the average of all of the records that are in that bucket. This is an example using two continuous variables, using BMI and age. Um, if you're using two categorical inputs, it would be even simpler. It would just be um, you know, a grid of of true false values and then a prediction at each value. So in this context, if you had all categorical inputs, this isn't a disadvantage. If you had uh, continuous inputs uh, and you wanted to have smooth predictions, then using it as tr a tree would not be a good case, would not be good in that context. So I could say, this uh, doesn't make a difference here as all uh, predictors are categorical. And we could just look at our cheat sheet under the decision tree to see the advantages and disadvantages. It's easy to interpret. It captures interaction effects, it captures nonlinearities, handles missing values. Disadvantages are generally low predictive power, um, is often a simplification of the underlying process because all observations have to be an average of the terminal nodes, which is what we just talked about. It's biased towards selecting high cardinality features uh, because there are more split points possible. So if you're using factor variables that have a lot of uh, factor levels, those are more likely to be used in the decision tree because uh, if you just randomly chose a split based on one of those values, it's more likely to pick up random noise in the data. So it has a tendency to overfit. Uh, there's also higher variance um, in other words, if you if you fit a tree like this, you might say, "Oh, it's fairly simple. There are only um, you know, there are only four values. I can convert this into a simple uh, yes or no 
series of questions. It's easy to interpret. But then when you go and retrain the model on new data, those questions might be very different. The model will change. Um, and it's unable to predict beyond the range of data uh, that's in the training. So in linear regression, your output is just a, um, it's a linear equation. So you can predict for values that are outside of the training data. It's not very reliable to do that. However, it is possible. With the tree, though, the predictions are only an average. And so um, all of the predictions are going to be um, within the range of the training data. And it's worth noting that here we simplified the factor levels. So this um, would, you know, this would be, could be corrected for. OK. Um, and now we finally get to the executive summary which is worth 20 points. Uh, so at this point, um, at this point, I would split the screen up. And then scroll back up to the initial tasks um, and then just summarize uh, each of the tasks. Uh, before this, though, I would I would go back to the um, go back to the business problem. Think about the big picture here. The big picture is that uh, the North Carolina Department of Transportation wants you to under wants you to help them to understand the factors that contribute to the severity of vehicle crashes. Uh, transit wants us to help them understand the causes of vehicle crashes uh, using predictive analytics we have uh, found the leading causes of crash of crashes as uh, based on the road conditions weather and terrain so this can be used in order to measure the safety and uh, risk of accident for different roads. Uh, the Department of Transit can use this info to improve those roads which are most dangerous. And now I want to look back at the, um, the interpretation here. I want to go to the interpretation section where we looked at the signs of the coefficients. So I'll say something like using data from historical vehicle crashes, we have 
we have identified the factors which um, which increase the frequency and uh, severity of accidents. We used a measure of uh, of crash called crash score, which is higher, which is a numeric measure of both the number of vehicles involved as well as the uh, amount of injury. The factors which uh, increase uh, this, the factors which increase a road's crash score are Uh, let me rephrase this. It's always it's always a little bit awkward to try to word word this uh, in an English sentence. I'll just say um, based on so these results. I'll say this analysis. This shows that, or our results show that for non-U.S. highways and state highways, the crash score is eight percent lower. Yeah, I think this is sufficient. So for non-highways and non-state highways, the crash score is 8% lower. For US highways, the crash score is 4% higher than for non-highways. For intersections, the crash score is 5%, 5% uh, higher. Driveways are 3% higher. Ramps are 10% lower. Non-driveways are 3% lower. Traffic signals are 6% higher. I'll say crashes are 6%. Crash scores at intersections Crash scores are 8% higher at stop signs. Okay. Um, and then I just go through the rest of the, the tasks and explain what I did at each step. So, or task number one, I would say, we collected data from uh, how many observations? From 23,137 observations. Uh, which and recorded and and compared info on the road conditions, weather, lighting, time of day, season, 
and other road and traffic characteristics to the crash score. And I only am willing to really, um, really summarize what I did. I'm not going to summarize what was already there or what um, what's, what has already been done for me. I made some uh, observations regarding the, uh, the number of accidents and crash scores at uh, different areas uh, and at different types of roads. And I looked at summary stats and graphs and found that um, and I, I might include a few of these bullet points just I'll just say uh, most crashes at intersections Well, I guess I don't want to include a lot of bullet points here because this would detract from all of these bullet points up here. Um, so I'll just say that I looked at several graphs and summary statistics. And then based on this, um, I made simplifications uh, the actual data, the original data had a lot of information, which was, uh, you know, too nuanced to be used in modeling directly. So I, uh, I simplified this. This is when we were uh, simplifying all the factor levels. Next, uh, now we looked at the principal component analysis. So we had several variables related to the weather and time of day. Actually, we had three variables. And so we used um, a dimension reduction technique known as PCA in order to simplify these uh, variables down into a single variable called well this was this was the good weather variable um, so th this took into account the uh, road conditions whether the road conditions were wet, dry, wet or dry, and if the weather was clear. I used this new feature as an input. I'll just I'll just say I'll use this new I'll use this simple information as an input to our predictive model. I also looked at interactions
interactions, which is when the uh, you know the impact that a variable has on the crash score is different for a depending. I guess I guess I, this is being too technical. Um, in the executive summary, the, the goal is to explain everything in um, non-technical language, as you would explain it to someone who's, you know, not a statistician or not a bit, not an actuary. Um, so I will just say I looked at interactions, which is when the impact of a variable um, depends is is related to the other variables. For example, um, if uh, if there is construction on a highway, this may have an elevated risk of accident uh, as compared to um, just driving on a highway um, without construction. Um, I looked at work area, road class, and what was the other variable? the road configuration and found uh, found that the uh, the crash scores changed depending on both the On the on the on the on if the area was a work area as well as you know if if it was a highway or not um, and I selected a distribution.